The next uh, presentation is by team BSSA, very nice uh, name, is Bohr, Seward, Sehan, Atkinson, team BSSA. Uh, um, uh, then by the time that uh, Dave is uh, coming, uh, if uh, give us a few seconds to copy the presentation for Okay, now for something a little bit different, a lot simpler, actually. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, provisional or preliminary model that we have at this point. And uh, you can see that the, the uh, authors are, have been expanded by a factor of two. We now have John Stewart and Emil Shehan. And the ultimate model, we may have some permutation of these names, which is just fine. But BSSA has sort of a nice uh, ring to it. Um, the model is, is really just basically the same as the BA08 model. It's very simple. We use the same functional form for magnitude and for distance. Um, the one change is that the, the site uh, effects, the site amplification, is now using uh, John Stewart and Emil's um, new model for that. And, but this is the functional form, so it's really it's basically the same. We have... Um, a function of magnitude, a function of distance, which also includes magnitude because we have a magnitude-dependent geometrical spreading. And then we have the site term. Because it's nonlinear, it's, it's not only a function of VS30, but it's also a function of M and R because the, we use peak acceleration uh, for a VS30 of 760 as the controlling parameter for that. Let's see. Um, and then the sigma, at this point in the model, we have a magnitude and distance independent uh, sigma made up of the inter and intra event sigmas, and we may be changing that. Here's the distance dependence. It's the same as before. We have the, the, uh, the first term in square brackets. That's the geometrical spreading term. So we have C1 and C2. Uh, the C2 is the magnitude dependent part of that. And then the last term is what we call the analastic term. That's not a very precise description. But it's uh, basically the log of motion is dependent on, on distance, uh, linear dependence on distance. And the, the definition of distance right here is in the bottom. It's uh, the square root of the RJB distance squared, which is a horizontal distance, and what we call a pseudo-depth term. And that pseudo-depth term is a function of period. The magnitude function is very simple. We just use a quadratic fit. And in fact, the first time we do the regression in the data, we just fit uh, one quadratic with uh, dummy variables depending on whether it's strike slip, normal slip, or reverse slip. Another change from BA08 is we don't have the undefined model in this case. It has to be one of the, uh, the three. So we fit the quadratic, and we look and see where the peak of the quadratic occurs. What magnitude does it occur at? And if it's um, less than something like 8.5, then we... Fit, then we change the regression and we introduce a linear uh, magnitude scaling for magnitudes greater than that hinge magnitude, but we constrain the slope to be greater than zero in that. And you'll see in the results we have right here that, that uh, in most cases the slope is in fact exactly equal to zero because, as Norm was just saying, the data really wants to have a negative slope, especially for short periods in the larger magnitudes. The site amplification function is very simple. It's just a, uh, a sum of linear and nonlinear. The linear is just uh, the log of VS30 uh, divided by the reference velocity, which we take as 760 meters a second. And then there's a, uh, the slope factor, B lin. We're using B lin from the Stewart and Shehan 2012 model. For the nonlinear amplification, it's actually a, a simpler form than we used in BA08. Uh, again, it's a, a coefficient in front of a log term, but the log term involves the PGA on the reference rock. When we do the analysis, we have to do an iterative analysis so that, that the PGA that we're using to adjust things to 760 is the same PGA coefficients as, we're using, as we end up with in the model. And the 0.1G helps round things off so that the, that the nonlinear effect doesn't keep uh, increasing you just don't have a nonlinear effect even for very small values of PGA. What we don't have in here, as you may have noticed, and what we did not have in the BA08 model is directivity, basin depth, hanging wall, although I should say that using RJB as the distance, primary distance measure helps this, as uh, some of Jennifer's results showed. 
And then uh, other possible predictor variables, which we do not have at this point, are dip and ZTOR, which uh, Norm just emphasized was very important. So here's how we got the coefficients. We, um, we select data so that we, we don't want um, data that's obviously affected by structures of some kind. Uh, in this case, we're restricting the analysis to less than 80 kilometers, whereas in BA08, we use data out to uh, uh, 400, I think it was. We're using just event class one as determined by the CRJB of 10 kilometers. We've tried other CRJBs, and this seems to be a good number to use. We adjust all the observations to 760 meters a second. Then we, and this is an important point, we constrain the C3, which is the analytic term, to the B08 values. And, and then now, I think John will mention, uh, following me, that, that he's doing some new analysis to have better values uh, constrained with the new data. But the reason that this is important is that we're not trying to solve for it, and yet it means that even though we're using data within 80 kilometers, our results are probably going to be applicable to greater distances because the C3 is capturing the, the uh, dependence on distance beyond 80 kilometers. And then we're regressing for the other coefficients and including the pseudo-depth H. We're not just taking the pseudo-depth H that B08 used because we found in analyzing residuals that there was a... Uh, some systematic biases around one kilometer, and therefore we're solving for H. This shows the results of uh, this. Uh, this is a two-stage regression, by the way, but it's it's like, it's pretty much like a random because in this second stage regression, it has to be done iteratively to <coughs> solve for the um, the inter-event sigma. Um, each plot is for a different um, measure of ground motion. We have PGV then PGA, and then 0 0.2, um, 1, 3, and 10 seconds. The, the symbols are one symbol per event, and magnitude you can see goes from 3 up to about 8.5, 8.6. And, and the different colors are for different uh, fault mechanisms, fault types. The solid curves are the predictions from the, uh, the fit, the regression fit to the curves. So you can see what I was saying, that once you get above 6.75, which is our hinge magnitude, uh, until you get down to 3 seconds and 10 seconds, the curves are flat, which means that we have no magnitude increase. But if you actually look at the data points, you can see that they would definitely support a negative or a decreasing uh, slope. Say if you look at 0 0.2 seconds, it, your eye would probably fit, um, would have a, a, a downward trend. And as Norm was saying, eventually we may find when people tell us about fault physics that, that there's nothing wrong with that. At this point, we just don't accept having a decrease of motion with increasing magnitude. This is just some comparisons of uh, the predicted motions as a function of distance for magnitudes from 4 to 8. And again, it's the same. Well, in this case, it's the shorter periods except for PGV. We have PGV, PGA, 0 0.05 seconds, uh, 0 0.1 seconds, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. The, the red curves are the new results. And the blue curves are from the modified BA08. And there was a modification that we had in 2011. Uh, I should say that in BA08, we had uh, almost no data for, uh, we had no data for less than magnitudes less than 4.2. But of course, now we have a lot of data. And if you look carefully at these pictures, uh, the biggest differences between the BA08 prime and the new values are for the smaller magnitudes and the closer distances. It's for the shorter periods. This is for longer periods going out to 10 seconds. These are, some, these are the inter-event residuals as a function of magnitude. Um, and the colors are for the different fault types. And the, the black horizontal lines are the uh, plus or minus the uh, one tau, which is the uh, inter-event standard deviation. And uh, we're assuming it's constant, but you can see, and Norma also emphasized this, that, that as you get to larger magnitudes, it looks like uh, the tau that we have is overestimating the actual tau. So we'll probably have to have a, um, our signals will probably have to be a function of magnitude. This is for 0 0.2 seconds. That's for one second right there. You can see overall it's a pretty good fit, even with a simple quadratic and linear term. This is the... Uh, Intra-event residuals, we remove the event terms, and this is a function of distance for 0 0.2 seconds. Um, the plus or minus um, standard deviation phi 
is given, they're given by those solid black, the heavy black lines. And there's a hint that maybe the standard deviation is smaller than those within a real close distances, but it's not quite as clear as with the magnitude. And this is for one second. Uh, remember, this is, I'm only showing residuals for data that we actually used in the analysis, but John's going to follow this showing data for, showing other data that we did not use. This is the scale, this is the residuals of function of BS30. Doesn't look too bad. And that's for, that was the last one was 0 0.2 seconds. This is for one second. And now it's time for John to come up and talk about the residual analysis. Okay, so um, as Dave mentioned, uh, he ran the two-step regressions to develop a model using data from distances under 80 kilometers and the C1 events. And what we wanted to do was evaluate the model performance against a larger data set. So those same data that Dave had used are used here as well, but then we also include data beyond 80 kilometers, and there are some magnitude distance cutoff criteria that I'll show you, but it goes well beyond 80 kilometers. We include both C1 and C2 events, um, and we end up with uh, about 16,000 recordings. Uh, so it's actually a lot more data points than, uh, than Dave had. Um, the procedure that we use to do this, the RE up there is not regarding. <laughs> It's random effects. So this is a random effects residuals analysis. And so, it, but it's an, the simplest possible regression that you could ever conceive of. Um, all we're doing is we're computing residuals, uh, which are RIJ. I is an index for uh, event, and J is an index for recording. So these are the computed residuals. The regression finds the constant term C. So this is, on average, across all the um, earthquakes, once they're adjusted for event terms, what is the misfit? Um, eta is the event term. You see the index is only on I. There we go. Uh, and this is the within event residuals. So we look at the event terms eta uh, relative to various source parameters. We look at the within event residuals epsilon um, relative to uh, site and path parameters. Um, and then we um, also wanted to have a look at site effects. This is kind of similar to what I talked about this morning. The difference, though, is that we have a much bigger data set that we're looking at now because of all the small magnitude events. So there's a lot more data points in the plot, and um, we can see some things we couldn't see in our earlier work, particularly for high VS30. So, we're going to look at uh, rock residuals, just like I described this morning. We'll call them epsilon ij with the superscript r for rock. And that's computed, just like we talked about this morning, using VS30 of 760, regardless of what the VS30 of the site actually is. Now, this is uh, the screening criteria that was used to lop off, essentially, large distance recordings for various magnitude events. The reason for doing that is as you get to very large distances, uh, you're preferentially only sampling unusually large ground motions that trigger uh, and are processed and distributed. You're missing the smaller ones and we don't want to have that bias in there. So this is actually adapted from a plot that Norm presented in one of the uh, coordination meetings. And um, the various symbols here indicate over time various types of sensors. So the um, solid ones are basically analog ones. The open ones are digital of various ages. And essentially what we find for older digital and analog, uh, the magnitude distance cutoff would be here. And so what this means basically is if you have a magnitude 6 and your distance is more than about 150, you're not going to include that data in the analysis. On the other hand, with more modern digital instruments, that magnitude 6, you could go all the way out to almost 400 kilometers. And so we just drew these lines here so we could code up a criteria for screening out these uh, large magnitude, I'm sorry, these large distance um, records. Um, remember, Dave is cutting off at 80. So we are including, he's cutting off basically through here. So we're including a lot more data uh, at the larger distances. 
for the residuals analysis. So these are some of the event terms. Um, and what we're showing here are event terms for C1 and C2 events with CRGB10. Um, we'll break it up by C1 and C2 in the next slide. So all the events are basically shown here, and these are binned medians in quarter magnitude bins. And uh, it's pretty flat. There's some jumping around. Um, but if, if there had been, for example, a strong trend with magnitude, that would indicate a problem with the magnitude scaling. Um, you do see some negative numbers out here at large magnitude, which is the oversaturation. Um, if we break it up by C1 and then C2, this is the C1 subset, so I'll scroll back. This is both. This is C1 only, and this is C2 only. And if we just go from both to C1, you don't see much change in the bin medians. So that's because most of the data is, in fact, C1. C2, uh, not seeing a big change here either. It's not like they're clearly higher or lower. Uh, we have not gone through and sort of formally calculated differences. Um, but uh, just sort of at a casual glance, there doesn't seem to be a huge effect, but we will be looking at this more carefully as time goes on. The existing model is basically a C1 model. So we'll, we'll be using this with a more careful inspection to define aftershock modification factors later. Um, this is sort of related to what Norm was talking about with depth, although uh, for the analysis done before this meeting, we were looking at hypocentral depth. Um, Dave actually just showed me the same plot with uh, top of rupture depth, which he did in real time as Norm was talking. <laughs> And um, so what you see here is the event terms versus depth, uh, hypocentral depth. And you do see this uh, pretty decent trend uh, coming up through here. Keep in mind that the axes are from 0 to 2. So this is a big range. So that's the type of trend line, I think, that Norm was showing, even though his depth parameter was different. And when Dave used top of rupture, what he just showed me uh, as I was sitting there is following a similar type of trend. So there is something there. Uh, that we'll have to take a closer look at. Although it's not as evident, it's pretty much a high frequency parameter. You don't see it at the longer periods. Moving to the within event residuals, uh, this is showing the epsilons now versus distance. So epsilon versus RJB. The different colors are um, C1s and C2s, and I should have labeled the one and the other. I think that the uh, Pretty sure that C1 is red and C2 is blue. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll break this down uh, as we go along. But this is showing the overall trend. What we're looking for, again, is flatness in them, and they are pretty flat. This is now just making them all black and then using bin medians and fairly flat in an overall sense. So it's showing that, on average, the distance attenuation features are not too bad. When you start looking at things regionally, I'm sorry, this was overall. This is California. So California is pretty good. Um, this is a subset of this other one. And California is pretty flat. Overall is pretty flat, too. I didn't show you those bin medians. If you go to China, uh, there's some funky stuff going on. And uh, it definitely starts to take off here when you get to large distances. And this is after quite a bit of screening. So we're getting rid of. Um, you know, a lot recordings that don't pass those thresholds that we talked about before. So it used to look a lot worse even after the screening. There's still something here. So this is suggesting that things are just not attenuating as fast in China. And so that supports a regional correction um, on the anelastic attenuation, at least. Um, this is Japan. So remember, California flat, Taiwan, I'm sorry, uh, China's Trending upwards, Japan um, varies a bit period to period. Uh, what we're seeing, for example, at point two is a downward trend. It's attenuating faster. This is Taiwan, uh, pretty flat, kind of similar to California. Now this one uh, is, there's a lot of stuff here, but basically it's different intensity measures in the columns, epsilon, um, for different magnitude bins in the rows. So less than four, this would actually be four to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. This was a very useful plot to have. It's obviously changed over time. Initially, we were seeing a lot of very negative residuals down here. And that's what led Dave to adjust the um, 
fictitious depth term. And now things are overall pretty flat. There are some cases where things jump up or they jump down at close distance, but overall um, reasonably good behavior. Now these are the within event residuals against VS30. Um, so it's essentially testing our model. Um, and things are pretty flat with VS30, so that's encouraging. But the, the, the thing that's kind of exciting as someone who's looked at site response a lot is that with the California small magnitude data, we've got a lot more out here than we used to have. And so all, a lot of these data points were not in the plots I showed you this morning. And there's really not much of a trend here for PGA, but if you start to go to these longer periods, you're starting to see things move up. I think I animated that. So that's suggesting there's a break in the slope. The VS30 scaling is not continuing on out to very fast velocities, particularly at long periods. So another way to look at that is to calculate the rock residuals I mentioned before, um, where you see the typical VS30 scaling slopes. So nothing new there. Uh, and they do pretty much continue to fairly fast velocities for the low periods. But when you get to these longer periods, things are flattening out. And so that's something that we'll need to build into the models. Um, so we'll basically be adjusting the site response model as we get out to faster velocities to put an end to the VS30 scaling. Or not an end, but to change the slope beyond some value. And the value where the, that slope changes will be period dependent. <clears throat> okay, um, so the summary is, uh, as Dave mentioned, it's a simple model. Uh, it retains the principal aspects of BA08. There is a trade-off for simplicity, um, as we've heard about. Um, by not including some of these other factors, we would expect to have a bit of a higher sigma. That may or may not actually come through, given that most of the data is not actually affected by these close-in effects. So the sigma may not show it, but we'll look, of course. The, perhaps more importantly from a design perspective is the model may not be applicable for certain conditions. So, you know, one that we're suspicious of, for example, is shallow dipping faults where the RJB distance parameter may not be capturing the hanging wall effect adequately. And there are probably others as well. Sorting through all that and seeing where the biases exist is something that we need to work on moving forward. So we're doing that. We do expect some changes. Um, so the, the existing coefficients are all based on the two-step regressions. We're working on implementing this in a random effects regression. Probably won't make much difference, but that's what we want for the final. Um, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, as Dave mentioned, uh, those C3 terms for analytic attenuation. We want to set them based on the SMM data for California. Then we'll look at regional variations. Those should be an aftershock correction. By aftershock, I mean C2 events. Um, you know, regional corrections for anelastic and VS30 scaling, as we've talked about all along. And um, we'll be doing a full set of residuals analysis against top of rupture, uh, various other parameters, base and depth, and uh, seeing whether changes are warranted. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Questions uh, for Dave and uh, John. For Dave and John, regarding their uh, preliminary models, model. Uh, John, early, early on you had um, made a comment that analog records at magnitude 6 were good out to 50 kilometers or something like that, but that digital records allowed you to get rec get records out to several hundred kilometers. This is not indicative of the quality of the instrumentation, is it, but rather of the um, uh, triggering capabilities of a digital record? Well, probably. I would defer to my seismologist friends for that. So the, the data points on that plot were coming largely from, from norm, but essentially if you plot the data out in a magnitude, let's see, ground motion, y-axis, distance, x-axis, um, and you plot it out, you start to see the data ending, and you, you look at features, and you, you basically through judgment you draw limiting distances, so I'm going to believe it out to here. And through that sort of judgment-driven process, limiting distance, distances were assigned for data within various magnitude bins. 
Um, now, what causes it? Probably it's, it is triggering, as you say. You know, the modern digital instruments are running all the time, right? Yeah. And uh, they have that, that memory, so they can, they can capture things the analogs wouldn't have caught. So right. um, I don't know enough about the details of an analog instrument to know whether it had, it had a different trigger threshold, maybe it could have had a decent recording of that. I would defer to Walt and others. Or, yeah, Bob, it, it, Bob, do you have any comments on it? Bob Darrow has been working on these things for at least 30 years. The only other thing to add is the modern digital instruments put in by Caltech and uh, Berkeley now are 24-bit digitizers, whereas the analog instruments, you are constrained by 2G on a 70 millimeter film scale. So you can only get, if you want to get 2G on scale and the width of your line, you were around 12, 10 to 12-bit instruments. And the modern digitals, the first generation digital was 16. The kinematrics now around 18. And the Quantera is used by Caltech and Berkeley are 24-bit. So you can just see much smaller earthquakes at much larger distances. All right. Uh, uh, Zia. Uh, why the strict to 80 kilometers? I Oh, sorry. Take this one. Excuse me. Um, as an end user, I can see problem coming when you restrict your data set to 80 kilometers. As many agencies we work for, they say use all the seismic sources within 100 kilometers at least, and then we will not be able to use as strongly your relationship when it goes to beyond 80 kilometers. So you were using before more than 80 kilometers. Now why only 80 kilometers you are restricting your data set? So I don't understand. I wasn't sure I understood your question. Are you asking why did I stop at 80 kilometers? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I can blame that on Ken Campbell, actually. <laughs> when, I was, when I was working uh, back in uh, last spring and doing this analysis with the data that we had, the new data at the time, um, I just used everything out to 400 kilometers, and I got really crazy magnitude scaling. It really upset me, and John independently found the same thing. And then talking to Norm Abrahamson, he was pointing out that my magnitude-dependent geometrical spreading was the cause of it, because there was a strong trade-off uh, between some parameters. And in this two-stage regression, the first stage, I'm presumably not paying any attention to magnitude scaling. In the second stage, all the magnitude scaling comes in. But what I do for the second stage is I adjust all of the observations into one kilometer distance, so that whatever the distance effect is, is going to then have a strong effect on the magnitude scaling. To make a long story short, I got very depressed, and I just put everything aside. And then I was talking to Ken like a month ago at one of these NGA developer workshops, and Ken said, oh, we never have any problem in, in determining both the geometrical spreading, uh, both coefficients for geometrical spreading, and the magnitude scaling looks fine. And, but he said, but we only use data less than 70 kilometer, 80 kilometers. And I, that night, and, and I ran the thing, with that restriction, and it looked great. So it's really based on trying to, not having the magnitude scaling being strongly controlled by the more distant data, where because of the way I was doing it, that data, because I have to extrapolate all the way into one kilometer, make a big difference if the extrapolation wasn't done properly. And so by restricting the anelastic term, as you can see from John's picture where we show the California, even going out to 500 kilometers, we have even the bend averages are essentially flat at zero. So that works very well. And this way, we, in effect, we're decoupling those two effects. Great. Uh, Christine? I'm not sure the question is still on. <laughs> Somebody's giving me some of my medicine. Um, I know. Everybody was waiting. Uh, so I, I'm not sure the question is still on. So. Um, oh, you're not. OK. Any other questions for Dave and John? Dave and John. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.